Welcome to History 111, Lecture 32, Changing Social Norms. The Tipper's Movement was a reaction against the widespread alcoholism of the 19th century. Now, most farmers produced more grain than they could sell and without a more developed transport network. As a result, they distilled large amounts of whiskey because that allowed them to preserve the grain, not let it go bad, and actually be able to get something that was feasible to move to a market. So as a result, alcohol was cheap and readily available, and large numbers of the population drank to excess, and bars were the principal centers of social life during this century. And in Western areas, drinking was essentially the only form of entertainment. Now, there were a number of problems associated with this level of alcohol consumption. There was a lot of violent crime, particularly assault, public disorder, domestic violence, poverty, and child neglect. And a lot of women at the time were alleging their husbands were spending all the money on drink instead of providing for their families. And the Tempers movement grows out of all of these perceived social ills, and it tends to be a female-dominated movement. Tempered societies are going to form... And a lot of them are going to involve reformed alcoholics who are going to begin speaking at meetings. And they're going to do things like confess the things they did wrong while drunk and talk about how giving up booze improved their lives. Now, about one million people signed anti-drinking pledges this time. Now, the temperance movement itself splits over the details. Some people call for a complete ban on alcohol, while others are calling for self-control. And in addition, in some areas, the movement was taking on an anti-Catholic character, which, which further caused divisions within the movement. This is a time when people are becoming more concerned with health as well, and people start turning to scientific fads for better living, and it's partly being fueled by a number of cholera outbreaks. This is going to be 30 more or years before Jon Snow figured out how cholera spreads, and this is a time when people thought that bad air spread diseases. Now, hydrotherapy was one of the early ones, and people believed that waters could be curative. Now, mineral waters from various springs became popular. We do need to remember there is a European tradition of holy wells that can supposedly cure people of different ailments, and that trend tradition is somewhat transplanted to the Americas, and so health spas become popular and grow up around some mineral springs. Various diet theories become popular as times people are seeking healthier ways to live. Now, one of the more famous ones is one put about by a Presbyterian minister named Sylvester Graham. He was really advocating for chemical-free food, and he really opposed white bread because he felt it had no nutritional value. So as an alternative, he came up with a flour formula and recipe that is now what's known as graham crackers. Now, this is also going to eventually be a big influence on later figures like the Kellogg brothers. Another area where people believe that they can ultimately live better is through behavioral science, and phrenology becomes a very popular one. And it's seen in literature like Dracula, Moby Dick, and a very Sherlock Holmes novels. Now, phrenology is based on a theory that each part of the brain controls different behavior and impulses. So what they want to do, phrenologists, is they want to measure people's skulls to determine their suitability for various jobs. The idea here is they can build a better society by measuring everyone's heads and figuring out, are they supposed to be a criminal, are they supposed to be a genius, and so on, all by determining which areas of the brain are most developed by using things like a tape measure and measurements. Now, since this has been proven to be completely unscientific, but people at this time thought that this was a cutting edge of advancement. Medicine also posed something of a challenge because this was a low prestige occupation. It was not well regulated and filled with quacks and snake oil salesmen as they are known back then. And attempts at regulation were opposed by the widespread anti-elitist feeling in the country. In other words, if you put bars to entry into medicine, that only benefited the rich and that really ran against the sort of Jacksonian democratic ideals that had taken root. Now, at this point, there's also no real understanding of disease and how it spreads, so medicine is fairly primitive. That said, there are some big advances made. Smallpox vaccine, anesthetic, and doctors start washing their hands and tools. Now, these changes were typically resisted, though, however, as a lot of these doctors felt that these were unproven techniques, and it took a long time for these things to actually really settle in fully. While the United States really was looking at ways to live better lives, in engaging in some ideas which were a bit odd and some which had some merit, there was a general trend towards people believing that people could better themselves, and this leads to renewed interest in education. For example, in Massachusetts, the school year was doubled, all the way up to a whopping six months, and teachers started receiving professional training. And the idea takes off, and teachers' colleges spring up all over the country to produce better teachers and quality teachers. Now, New York State is going to be the first state to start using taxes to fund schools, and all other states are ultimately going to follow, so people start trying to invest in education.
Now, there are, however, big educational disparities within the country. In the North, 72% of children attend school, but large numbers are what they call casual students who come here and there, that they come to school maybe once a week, or maybe they don't come for two or three weeks and then come every day for a month and then disappear for a while. These are not people in solid, regular attendance. In the South, however, it's only about 33% of the white population that's attending schools. Within the West, large numbers had no access to schools at all due to the dispersed population. And what that means is, within the North, there's about a 94% literacy rate. For the White South, it's 83%. For the South, overall, it's 58%, and that's because only 10% of the black population can read. And remember, at this time, there are laws in a lot of Southern states that outlaw education for black people. As a result, they just have no access to that. Now, there are some other educational movements that come into this that go in different directions. For example, there's the Perkins School for the Blind and Handicapped, but there's also the Alcott Transcendental School that really was set up to try to get children to teach themselves and learn from their inner wisdom. So they really thought that children already knew everything they needed to know, it was just a matter of teaching the children how to access all that knowledge that was already within them. Now, schools were also set up at this point as a way to instill social values in children, and people believe that a well-disciplined child will make a well-disciplined and productive member of society. One area that received particular attention at this time was the prison system. Now, until 1820, there had been a single jail for criminals, debtors, the mentally ill, senile, and beggars, and sometimes jails were literally holes in the ground. Now, social movements began to try to create better institutions with the idea of reforming the various inmates and meeting the different needs of the different types of aid. Now, the penitentiary theory became very common, and this theory, they said that moral laxness led to crime, therefore a highly disciplined environment was the cure. So it would use solitary confinement for everybody and put inmates on silent work crews. The idea being this would give them time to think about the moral failing that had led them to crime in the first place, and also teach them self-discipline through long, steady work. Therefore, the idea being, if they were there because they didn't have the right morals, putting them in a highly disciplined environment would teach them right morals and therefore prevent them from reoffending. However, overcrowding really eventually caused the rehabilitation aspects of the penitentiary theory to be dropped off and fail altogether. Now, asylums, importantly, were set up for what they saw as social deviants and mentally ill, and they're going to be separated from the prison system, which is in and of itself an improvement. Now, this is going to also be a similarly highly disciplined environment, and it's also going to lead to things like the creation of orphanages to instill discipline and responsibility in children. The thought here being, this will be a preventative measure. It was assumed that orphans would become criminals otherwise because they had nobody to raise them and no one to teach them values. So that would be the responsibility of the orphanages. Now, some people also advocated setting up the school system to be run just like this as well. They also set up at the point what they call homes for friendless women and the assumption being other that if women were not given a disciplined environment and were single and out there they would become prostitutes and that really kind of tells us just what they thought of women back then and how sexist their opinions were and they also at the same time are going to start workhouses for the poor and again they feel that really that people being in these types of situations is a result of a moral failing and that they need to teach values through strict environment and strict discipline and that if people have the right values they'll behave the right way. Now we look back at that and we know there's a little bit more to it than that because there's other factors but this is marks a movement away from just simply throwing everyone into the one building together and not taking any action to correct it. So this does represent a significant step, even if it looks like it's not a complete step to us in this century. The last area we need to look at is women. Now women were really at this point starting to argue against injustices. They start to argue for the need for public education, they start to argue against the abuse and neglect of criminals and mental patients, they start to argue against slavery, they start to argue against alcohol and for prohibition, and they start to argue about women's legal position. So women are becoming increasingly active in these movements. Now since the revolutionary period, the population and geographic boundaries of the United States kept shifting west. And that was going to mean a shift away from farming towards manufactured goods and so on. And with this means is the traditional areas of society are breaking down and leaving people without a sense of community and these women are really stepping up to argue a about what is the best way to fix the injustices they see that are coming out of this breakdown of the old system and change into the new. 
Here we have a cartoon which really sums up a way a lot of women felt about their position. And if you can read what's there on the bindings on her, artificial li limitations, prejudice, custom, and more importantly was gagging her is no vote. So the Seneca Falls Convention is going to come together and serve as a rally for women's rights activists and women have been very concerned with all these different movements and but increasingly they're concerned with themselves and why they're being held back and how they're not able to make the type of progress that they want. So this this convention is going to encourage women that are not in the movement to join or at least start to think about their lives. And they're also trying to persuade men, particular politicians, husbands, fathers, bosses, clergy, doesn't really matter, that these issues deserve their consideration. Now, at the Seneca Falls Convention, they write an important document called the Declaration of Sentiments, and it really emphasizes some key points. They say women are citizens that are suffering in silence, and they're suffering in silence because they have no vote. They also say that it's wrong that married women have no control over their property, and that married women are essentially slaves to their husbands. Now, they also make a key point. They say that women have less rights than any man, including non-citizens. So they say that women are really at the bottom, and they believe that this is a situation which cannot continue. Now, unfortunately for the Seneca Falls Convention, what they did was they used the preamble of the Declaration of Independence and rephrased it slightly to make it a declaration about the rights of women. Now, that unfortunately blew up in their faces because what happens is the convention was widely reported in the press to have mocked, not utilized the Declaration of Independence, and people started trying to spin it in the papers about it being somehow un-American what they were doing. So after the convention, a lot of parties start to remove their names from a document due to social pressures, and people people really start to back off from this movement. And what happens is this really put the women's movement back several steps and really begins the negative connotation that the word feminism has sometimes today. So what's the big idea here? Well, it really comes down to people want a better America. They want better health. They want to solve various social ills they see, like problems with alcohol or problems with the jail system. So things like penitentiaries and asylums are popular. They want better education so that people can go about the process of helping perfect themselves as they see it. Now, remember, there are some calls for a more equal society, and it's going to be a very long time before we see steps taken there. Women are advocating for rights and advocating for a more equal society, and they are not going to get what they're asking for at this stage and they're going to in fact suffer setbacks so it's going to be a long time before we see any real progress on women's rights. See you in the next lecture.